This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amrys Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. And thank you all for being with us today for another CLHO workshop. Um, we are really fortunate to have with us today um, a museum evaluation professional and expert who's also a member of our board, Karina Wiesevich. Um, and yeah, of course, I was like just promising myself how I was not going to stumble over that like two seconds ago before we got started. Um, uh, before I introduce Karina, I want to welcome you all again. Um, mention once again that this program will be recorded and available afterwards on our YouTube channel. Um, and we're just really thrilled to have you with us today. Um, a few logistic things before um, we get started or go any further, um, you know, please remember, especially with um, such a big group here today, to make sure that you're muted unless you're speaking. Um, and we'll let you know if you're trying to speak and, um, you know, it, and you need to unmute yourself because we all make that mistake even two years into this pandemic, right? Um, and also, um, you know, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, and we will cue those up for our presenter after she's finished her presentation. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Um, if I mute you, please don't be offended. It just means there's background noise that's interfering with everybody else's ability to hear what's going on. Um, you all know me. Um, I want to take a moment before we get started with Karina's presentation to introduce you to the newest member of the Connecticut League of History Organizations team, Emily Garfinkel, who just joined us last week as our new membership and programs manager. So I just wanted to um, hand things over to Emily um, to unmute yourself for a second and introduce yourself and say hello, Emily. Thanks so much, Amaris. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as Amaris mentioned, my name is Emily Garfinkel. Um, and as of last week, um, I am the new membership and programs manager with um, the Connecticut League of History Organizations. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of this team and to work with all of you going forward. Um, as we you know, come back together in person, maybe some things will be a little less virtual. Um, it'll be great to um, see all of your lovely faces in person. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, prior to joining the league. Um, I come from the Connecticut Restaurant Association where I did um, pretty similar work that I hope to bring to the league um, in respects to membership, programming, events, um, nonprofit growth um, in respect to the hospitality industry. Um, so I'm really just thrilled to be here um, and part of the um, overall uh, humanities team in Connecticut and um, continuing the awesome work of the league. So it's nice to meet all of you and um, I'll let us get started with our presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Emily. Um, without further ado, um, I am going to hand things over to um, the person you are actually all here to see today um, and that's Karina. Karina is the is the assistant program director and a senior lecturer in the museum studies program at Johns Hopkins University, but she lives here in Connecticut. She's based in West Hartford um, and she's worked in the museum field for um, over 25 years, not just um, in house working in museums, but also extensive work uh, in consulting. Um, so she works with all kinds of museums, history, science, art, um, as well as performing arts institutions. Um, she's worked with the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, um, the Florence Griswold Mu Museum, and Mystic Seaport here in Connecticut. And I know that she is going to share um, other stories from other Connecticut institutions. Um, she is also uh, one of our um, most recent additions to the CLHO Board of Directors. So we're really thrilled to have her um, sort of on, on, the, on the league's team as well, um, and especially sharing her expertise with you today. So um, without further ado, Karina Wiesewicz. Thank you. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see how this goes. We practice this. Okay. Did it work? Looks yes. perfect, Karina. Oh, Take it away. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I cannot believe the size of the crowd um, that this has attracted. Um, I don't think that would have happened a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I think it is an indication, um, as Amrus was saying, that there's something afoot that, um, you know, 
museum evaluation is becoming more and more common. Um, sometimes it's required, sometimes it's just uh, a nice thing to do um, at a museum or historic site. And we're gonna talk about all the reasons why you might wanna do it and barriers to actually doing it and give you some you know, tools to sort of figure out uh, what, you know, what's next for, your, for you and your institution with evaluation. Um, and we're going to, as Emrys also said, you know, we had this vision of it being, you know, sort of 25 or 30 people and having breakout rooms and homework and workshops. So we have some ideas for how to sort of capture some of that flavor going forward. Um, and we'll talk about that um, at the end. So today, um, let's see, we're going to have a crash course um, in evaluation uh, theory and methods. And hopefully that'll be a lot of fun. It's a course that I teach at Johns Hopkins, both uh, an intro evaluation course and an advanced evaluation course over, you know, sort of 15 weeks. So we'll be doing it in an hour. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think you'll get a lot out of it and it'll certainly give you some, some new ideas of things that you can try um, at your place. Um, we're definitely going to have some case studies from around Connecticut because it just helps to sort of hear what your neighbors are doing. Uh, and I'm thrilled to see some, um, some of my uh, clients and friends, colleagues um, in the audience today. So that's really nice as well. Um, we'll definitely spend some time talking about all the different ways evaluation can help um, at your different sites. And whether you are small or large or medium, um, there are lots of ways that evaluation can be done, you know, like sort of like starting tomorrow almost um, to sort of make things work better um, at, you know, at re your relationship with your visitors. And it's very important to find out how, how you can do this. So there's, uh, I'll be talking about resources and resources are both things like, the absolute evaluation Bible that I'll introduce you to um, and websites to get more information because some of you will want to tackle some of this in-house. But if you, if you have a project that seems bigger than something you can handle, we'll also be talking to you a little bit about some funding options um, and next steps. And you know, as we've sort of been alluding to, we would love to try to figure out a way to make uh, an in-person get together of as many people as possible um, at the CLHO conference in June. So that's a lot to tackle and here we go. So let's see, um, Amherst gave a, a very nice overall uh, introduction to myself and I will not belabor any of those points, but just to sort of um, show you some of the, the odd ways, the odd roundabout unorthodox way that I became an evaluator, because I think it's sort of, um, it's a way to kind of open up people's eyes to what the world of evaluation is. Um, we'll talk in a few minutes about some preconceptions of evaluation. Um, and I'm, I hope that I can sort of explode <laughs> some of those preconceptions. Um, it's not just about educational testing, but it is very wide ranging. So I had never done any evaluation and there I was a master's student um, doing my work on zoo exhibits. Um, so polar bears were my specialty. Um, and I studied polar bear exhibits around the United States. Um, as an evaluator would. So looking at whether the needs of polar bears are being met and zookeepers and visitors. So three different types of users in one space. Um, and that just sort of lit my fire about so what evaluation could do in, in a museum setting. I then moved to New Zealand for a few years at a really opportune time because the New Zealand Lottery Commission had just released millions and millions of dollars to all of the five main cities in New Zealand, specifically for museums. I mean, it's hard to even fathom, you know, like what that meant. But so there was this explosion. This was in the early '90s, and New Zealand had tons of money and no one to do anything. And so there I was, a lowly grad student, being pulled into projects. Um, and I had a mentor um, who had come from the Canadian Museum of Civilization. She was an evaluator, and she just took me under her wing and handed me a stack of uh, textbooks and articles about evaluation. And I learned um, through her. Um, and then I came back to the United States and I worked at several museums in-house as an evaluator or as an exhibit planner. And the two of them are, of course, closely intertwined. Um, and then gradually, gradually became more and more interested in training um, new evaluators, uh, which is most of what I do at Johns Hopkins, um, and also doing consulting work um, at all types of places, mostly in New England and, and Connecticut specifically. So you'll recognize some of these places. but. Um, and whether it's a garden or a historic house or an exhibit or a program, all of those things can be evaluated. And because of my background in sort of in zoo exhibits and museum architecture, we there we certainly don't focus just on educational um, objectives, but we take a, a look at the rich, messy, holistic world of what our museum sites are um, and what the ex museum visitor experience is. So we'll be talking a lot about that. 
Um, and Amherst, we did have um, um, our first poll. I had this vision of everybody unmuting themselves and briefly introducing who they were and where they worked. Clearly that can't happen, alas, um, but we have a, a poor proxy. So um, Am Amherst, if you could run that poll. Excellent. Great, so if you haven't done the poll thing before, um, you should get a little dialogue box that pops up. And if you can just answer the question, um, that would be great. And the good news is that I can see it. During a trial run earlier, I was not able to see the poll. So now I can see it and I see it in live time, which is very exciting. I wish all my surveys were like this. <laughs> <laughs> very exciting. All right, exhibits and curatorial is a head by a hair, closely Except followed real, by collections we're small. of archives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me see. know when you'd like me to end that. Stretch. We're at 88% wow. participation right now. Yeah, that's excellent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that I was get, a full yeah. minute now. Yep. We're at 90 I'm going to end the poll. Yep. Okay. Wow. That's I'll share wonderful. the so results with everybody so you can see them. Yeah, that is excellent. So one of the most impressive things I see right now is the, the um, that collections and archives are as well represented as exhibits um, and, and that's really unusual. And to me, one of the best signs <laughs> that I've seen in a long time. Um, I think, you know, more and more evaluation is being seen as something that not just exhibits people do or education people do, but that there's a reason why, um, you know, almost anything you do in a museum, you know, connects to evaluation. So um, that's excellent. Um, well, thank you for that. Okay. So now let's see if I go forward here. So yes, um, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I, I can't stress enough is that, you know, almost anything you do in a museum and, you know, so frequently I have students who come in and they want to study um, archives or museum marketing, uh, they want to be a curator, and they're not sure, you know, if evaluation makes any sense for them. And by the time they take the class, they think, oh my goodness, like, how could I have thought that this skill wasn't something I needed? Um, it really helps a lot. Some of it is more obvious. Um, and certainly if you work in education or marketing or exhibits, you know, you're more used to sort of the notion of collecting data uh, about, you know, during the process when you're designing something or after a new exhibit is launched or a program is launched or a marketing campaign and you want to get feedback about it. But everybody behind the scenes benefits from that as well. And certainly, you know, when you have a team of people working together, it helps to have real visitor input to bring to those uh, team planning sessions. And front of house, um, I mean, you know, sometimes an evaluation can consist of only talking to people in the front of house because they see everything. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. Okay. Um, so the next is just, uh, this is just a very short poll. And I promise there's not too many of these, but just, I sort of wanted to get um, uh, the, the flavor of sort of what was happening. So if we could do poll number two. This is great too. <laughs> it's way more exciting than I thought it would be to see it come in like this. It's great. So what do we see? We see that, uh, yes, so those two most practical things. So learning about evaluation methods and then how you can apply them at your place, which makes complete sense. And um, I can almost guarantee that, all, <laughs> that both of those things will happen. That's great. And we had 95% on that one. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so um, one of the, and you know, if you're feeling game, by all means, you can type something into uh, chat um, at preconceptions and do not be shy. Uh, I, I, I ask this of my students in my class and I tell them to please be brutally honest and I get brutally honest <laughs> reactions. Uh, people think evaluation is boring. People think evil, um, you know, it's something that your director made you do. Uh, those are those are all fair, um, and, and hopefully we can convince you, you know, by the end of this session that some of those are, um, you know, are are not realistic. 
Um, most, most of the time, I think people leave sort of thinking that evaluation is a lot more useful and more fun um, than they thought. So uh, just to sort of you know, bring you through a couple of these, uh, and, and because there's, they're not just sort of funny, but they also bring home a point. Um, how many evaluators does it take to change a light bulb? Um, I can't answer that without a timing and tracking study, stratified for random patterns, and segmented for gender income and zip code. So that is definitely a perception that you know, we, um, we, we tend, that we can get sort of fussy with how we collect data and how we use data. Um, the other one was, um, and this is sort of a classic one, I was out in the parking lot the other night and saw an exhibit designer and evaluator crawling around. I asked him if they needed help and the designer said she lost her car keys. The evaluator said, oh, sorry, the poll's going. She said, she dropped them across the street, but it's so dark over there. I told her to look here under the street light because it's easier to see. And that is absolutely a criticism that gets uh, lobbied at uh, museum evaluation, that it fails to capture the actual reality of what happens in our messy and wonderful um, museums and historic sites. Um, that it, you know, it, it constricts things so much that it becomes artificial. Well, that's not, that's not all that evaluation is, and that's certainly not good evaluation. So let's plunge into what is evaluation and why does it matter? Um, I'm always thrilled to see when the evaluation world collides with something which is sort of much more exciting, <laughs> perhaps, in the museum world. And in this case, uh, Nina Simon's work. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with her. Uh, she is a really dynamic, um, out there museum uh, professional uh, persona, larger than life. Um, she worked uh, you know, as a museum director for a while, now she's consulting. But if you haven't experienced her work, you should check it out. Um, the website is Museum 2.0. Um, you can find it pretty easily by Googling it. But she is all about creating participatory experiences. And you know, so the audience-centered uh, institution, that visitors create their own meaning, that visitor voices should be used to sort of help create um, exciting experiences in museums. And all of this can sort of be flipped slightly to sort of say, and that's exactly what evaluation does as well. Um, and so, you know, good evaluation, you know, opens a channel between the museum and the visitor. And so I, I highly recommend sort of ch checking out Nina Simon because it's just another way to sort of round out, um, you know, some of the work that I'll be talking about today. Um, and so, you know, you know, it, maybe it sounds nice in theory and maybe it sounds kind of academic, but, you know, why should you all care about this? Um, certainly there's the bottom line and that the bottom line can factor in, in a variety of ways. Maybe you got a grant uh, and the grant requires you to do some evaluation work to show that the money was well spent. Fair enough. Sometimes um, the bottom line fe features into it uh, because you need to do a marketing survey to find out, you know, what new topics people might be interested in, and you know how to attract people to uh, a program. So all of that, of course, is is fair. But I think the bigger picture is the one that's more important, which is that you, if you're looking at the whole museum as a system, um, that it, you know, we can't survive without visitors. We need them, we need things to work for them. It just makes sense. And things you know, tend to be better when both sides are communicating well. Part of the reason we got into this trouble <laughs> as a field was because of this sort of um, very high notion that you know, museums were created and maintained by the high for the low, by the washed for the unwashed, by those who knew for those who didn't, but needed to know and would come. Um, and, and we, you know, many of us have sort of moved, tried to move past that. It's not always easy to move past that because frankly, it's easier sometimes to rely on our own um, expertise behind the scenes or inside, um, but evaluation helps break down that system. And most of the time, you know, we know anecdotally, and sometimes we know through evaluation that we, we have a problem as a field, that visitors don't always get the messages that we hope they get um, and that they don't use things the way we expect them to be used. Um, a lot of the early work, uh, especially on the way visitors used it, came from the architecture field, um, which is how I got trained initially. And architects really have a bad reputation of um, designing things that are that don't necessarily consider how actual users are going to use spaces. Um, so, so the system is sort of set up to be a little bit difficult to begin with. 
And part of that is because there are enormous cultural gaps. Um, you know, we may think that we try to think the way a visitor thinks, and maybe we have children or we have elderly parents, and we try to remember what it's like to sort of come to a museum for the first time or come to the museum with someone who doesn't see well, um, but or, or, or come to the museum and not inherently understand what the content is about. But you know, we very quickly become, um, you know, sort of the the expert creator or the expert insider, and and it becomes harder and harder to remember what it's like to not be that person, including visitors in the process um, through evaluation, uh, helps helps us reground ourselves as museum professionals. Um, one little anecdote that I think sort of summarizes a lot of, <laughs> of, of how it is when we work inside a museum. So I worked at the Museum of the Earth, which is a paleontology museum connected to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I was brought in as an exhibit planner and evaluator. And I sat around lots of big conference rooms, conference room tables with people who had PhDs in paleontology. And those people thought that this was going to be, this type of display was going to knock the socks off of visitors to the new, new Museum of the Earth because it knocked their socks off. And when they looked at these objects, those objects spoke to them and they saw stories and they saw the meaning. And I kept saying, mm, I'm not sure that those objects do speak to people who don't know the background. And we built a full-scale prototype um, inside the Museum of the Earth and we brought visitors in and visitors did not know <laughs> what any of those objects meant. And something that the, the uh, paleontologists thought, you know, visitors would spend half an hour looking at, visitors spent two minutes looking at, and the paleontologists wept and we went back to the drawing board. Um, and the other big epiphany came when we went to the Johnson Museum of Art on the Cornell campus, the paleontologists and I, and they said, we don't know what we're looking at. <laughs> we don't know what any of this means. And so that was sort of the, uh, the aha moment that, you know, unless you help visitors meet, meet, you meet you halfway, um, it's, it's just, um, it's a difficult battle. And so this was one of the finished products at the Museum of the Earth where they learned, um, we as a team figured out how to take fossils and put them into some context um, to sort of show how that, how that fossil connected to once was a large um, fish, to put a background mural to show the kind of environment it lived in. That, you know, just a case with little objects out of context didn't work. So this was just a nice tangible way that those paleontologists learned that they had to help people. Whew, okay. And I know we're, we're moving fast, but uh, part, part of the reason that, you know, as my training as an evaluator, I also did projects in hospitals and train stations and even an airport once. Um, and I can tell you that museums are one of the most complex environments um, and you wouldn't think so. I mean, they're not life or death the way a hospital is, but they are complex places that people have to do wayfinding. They have to buy tickets. We want them to learn something. We want them to be moved by what we show. Um, we have symbolism built into certain parts of our sites and buildings. All of that has to happen at once. And we even you know, have events at the same time. So that's a lot to ask of a place. And it's no wonder that the communication system um, can break down. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, so you know, I say, you know, we all have our, you know, uh, whether it's the clock museum or the paleontologists or um, a room full of model ships um, at Mystic Seaport, there will always be some visitors for whom context does not matter at all, that they love those objects, they know those objects. And so, you know, we can probably all think of a time where that was us, you know, maybe you like um, pottery or there's some sort of special thing where it doesn't matter to you if the design, I mean, there are no labels on this vitrine, you know, it's a fairly standard, um, you know, display, but if you really like looking at those objects, you don't care, but, or, think of a time where you were just so mesmerized by the architectural setting of a place that once again, the content doesn't, didn't matter as much. 
but that's not the reality for most of us. You know, most of us work somewhere in the in the hard middle <laughs> with content that needs to be made more interesting um, in a setting that we really need to work hard at sort of making it captivating. Um, and so that's that is that's one of our challenges. Um, I don't normally like to drag people through uh, definitions, um, and so I, so I won't <laughs> won't exactly do that to you. But I do. So the next couple slides um, are are some some definitions. But I want you just to focus on the, the words that are sort of uh, pulled out in color. So what is evaluation? It's you know obtaining knowledge from and about museum visitors. Um, and the committee on audience research and evaluation um, is part of AAM. We'll talk a little bit about them later. Um, this quote here, these quotes here are from an evaluation toolkit, which I have later as you for a resource, because it is one of the best things I have ever found as like a how-to guide to do evaluation. Um, and so the quotes here are, it's measuring the effect and performance throughout an activity, it may, and it may question the overall direction and the benchmarks themselves, which I love. So it's not saying we're just going to measure, you know, what, what you said you were going to do and then what happened, but through the process of evaluation, it's kind of a fluid system and you may begin to question that maybe you didn't set out with the right objectives to begin with, or maybe things are happening that you didn't expect that are as wonderful as things you expected to happen. Um, evaluation done well can also be about the how and the why of what worked and what didn't. And I like how that just sort of takes it down a notch. Like, it's okay. You know, this is not, um, we're not, you know, you're not being judged. It's really just, um, you know, it's, it's taking the temperature. Randy Korn, Judy Diamond, and Beverly Sorrell are three of the guiding lights in the museum field, especially in things like evaluation. Um, and so here are some other words. Uh, evaluation is a process and a tool that guides the team's decisions and actions. So again, it's not this sort of harsh thing that comes in at the end and tells you what you did wrong, but it's done well. It's part of the process. It helps you design better things. Uh, tools that help gather information. Um, Beverly Sorrell, it's done during the exhibit development process. That is when people really need it. Um, and then Jeff Hayward, um, who is just up in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, it, I love this one too, that it does provide hard data, but the most important thing is that it informs the intuitions of project team members, which I think is such a great way of saying it. So frequently, you know, we're sitting around a table and, you know, you're, you're coming up with an idea for a new program or a new exhibition and people around that table, it, maybe it's a curator and maybe it's an educator and maybe it's an exhibit developer and you have intuitions collecting even just a little bit of data from a visitor really helps inform the intuitions. So um, those are things that evaluation is. What is evaluation not? It is definitely not market research. And you may be thinking, well, it sounds a little like market research. And it does sound a little like market research because some of the methods are similar. Surveys, uh, interviews, those are all things that a marketer would use as well. But what the difference is in the way we use our data. So let's say you find out through evaluation that people are more interested in blacksmithing than coopering research plan where you said, okay, we're only going to do, we're only going to talk about blacksmithing. Then. You're not going to, if your mission and your vision and the people who work at your museum say, really need to cover both of those skills, you are going to do both, but now you've learned, oh, sorry, I hope I didn't freeze. <laughs> now you're, but now you know that maybe coopering is a harder sell and you need to work a little harder at making that a compelling um, story. And so you'll come up with different hooks and maybe you'll even do a prototype and talk to visitors again later and say like, now do you understand what coopering is? Does this make it more interesting? Uh, we have this hands-on activity, would you like to try that? So it's all in what happens with your data. And um, I think that sometimes an important distinction to make, You know, I've, I've been brought into museums where there've been a lot of people sitting around a conference table sort of um, reluctant to listen to me because they thought that this was going to sort of be um, like a verdict uh, on their work that, you know, whatever the visitor said was going to, um, you know, possibly preclude an idea that they had. And, and it is not that. I mean, it all needs to be tempered with with your mission, with your collections, with what you what, with what you want to do, but it makes you do your things um, in a more audience centered way. So we can 
pause ever so briefly here. Um, if anyone has sort of a burning question and you can either unmute yourself and ask it, or you can pop it in chat and we will all take a look at it at the end. Great, we just, the only thing we have in the chat so far, Karina, um, is a comment from Fielding Hampton saying that most evaluations I've seen completely fail to obtain user feedback or discard what is received. After all, why would experts need opinions of amateurs? Glad to see so many who aren't stuck on that question. Mm. Yes, that's excellent. I love that. And that's exactly right. Um, but, you know, I think um, institutions that use it regularly, and I, and I have some, you know, like repeat clients in this audience, you know, we can, we can even introduce their voices later in the process too. But I think, um, you know, it, it ties into this, this, um, this notion of that it's not market research and that the visitor voice is important to listen to. It's not going to tell you what to do, but it's, you know, it's sort of like a dance back and forth of, of, of the insider, you know, of museum staff and visitors, we'll call them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for posting that. Um, okay, so how can evaluation um, help? You know, and maybe you're already thinking of ways it can help, but um, wow, that was fun. <laughs> um, okay, so this is sort of a dreary looking uh, slide. Um, I apologize, but uh, I just, there were lots of things I wanted to, to, to get across here. So certainly evaluation can better understand both, both your visitors and your non-visitors. Um, and that's an important thing. Um, so, you know, there are times where um, I'm only focusing on current visitors in a project. And then there are times where we want to talk to people not coming. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Mystic Seaport had a study recently and Florence Griswold had a study recently where we not only to people who know and love those institutions, but people who don't know or don't love and to try to find out um, you know, how we can sort of improve the way we reach out to people. Uh, certainly identifying strengths and weaknesses. And again, this is at any level. Um, it's, you know, it could be institution wide, it could be a gallery, an exhibit, a program, um, a signage panel, a brochure, a marketing campaign. But um, it can certainly help a museum decide where to put resources if you find out that some things are suffering where others are not. Um, and I, I, I like this, like, ensure that acted upon uh, within the organization, you know, that's a big, that's a big thing to do. And that comes back to sort of how the data is used. So, you know, one of the cliches about evaluation is that, you know, you check that box, the director got the report, and then the director files the report. And that's, that's obviously not optimal. Um, and, you know, most of the institutions that seem to know and love evaluation use it in a much more organic way. And years from now, um, they'll be referring to it and saying like, but remember that study that showed that, um, you know, that type of font wasn't so good or that people preferred interactives of this type, that it becomes sort of like part of the living uh, lore um, that gets, you know, that gets used. And that's up to the, to the institution. Um, anticipating problems um, that can be resolved early on, um, you know, we, we all, and, and problems can be a, a variety of problems. You know, interactives might not work. Light levels may be too low. Um, people may not understand what we offer. Um, so sort of, you know, getting ahead of the, of the situation. I had several museums that, um, that I helped during COVID because as you all know, the landscape changed so fast and so quickly with, um, with what you could offer, what you could do. And so um, we did a lot of sort of preemptive um, work at what audiences would tolerate and you know, what kind of online programs, when were they feeling safe to come back in. Um, demonstrate to funders. I mean, that's, you know, that's the classic, um, but you know, certainly you can do way more than that. And for some places, I mean, life or death. Um, it, maybe that's a little too dramatic, but it's certainly, you, you know, staying relevant and staying open and staying viable um, are, are very important, obviously. And, you know, evaluation can really help you, you know, in, in little and big ways, sort of find those sweet spots of, of what you're doing well now that you should keep and things that you should be doing differently. And let's see. Uh, and this is just sort of a, oh, I hope I didn't freeze. Um, a slightly fancier way of sort of collapsing some of those categories. So when to, when should you evaluate? Certainly when there's a problem. Um, when you know that people are not going to a particular gallery or complaining about something that you offer, or people aren't signing up for a virtual program, 
you absolutely need to find out what's going on. Sometimes it's a little more um, esoteric, academic. Um, you know, we're working on a QR code study um, at Mystic Seaport right now, and it's sort of an experimental um, project because there was a feeling that visitors might want more information. We didn't know, but the, but the staff didn't know how to provide that extra information. So the first round was to put QR codes on labels um, and to make a long story short, QR codes are not working. So back to the drawing board, but, but it's a good experiment. And it was a relatively um, quick and cheap way to sort of find something out. Certainly when you have a new idea um, and want to test it out, and we'll be talking about some really great projects, um, the Litchfield Historical Society, um, I've been working with them on a new exhibition. Uh, and so when you have a new idea and you want to find out what visitors um, are curious about or what they know about it, uh, refining, my staff have a conflict of opinion. <laughs> that, that is sort of a, a funny, but useful way that evaluation can really help. Um, and sometimes there are stalemates around those conference tables uh, in exhibit development or program development meetings or marketing development uh, meetings. And a small bit of data can help uh, break through that. So let's see, the way to uh, get started is, you know, to really get back to the basics of what are your questions? What do you need to know? Uh, what do you want to know? when in the process makes the most sense for you to get that feedback and what types of methods um, will give you the best data to answer your questions. So these are the classic, um, you know, and you'll, you know, if you know anything about evaluation, you know, you've probably heard these terms, um, front end evaluation, formative and summative. They happen at three very distinct moments um, during the life of a project. Um, at the very beginning, when all you have is an idea that someone says, I want to do, you know, an exhibit about tugboats, um, you could do front end evaluation to find out what visitors know about tugboats, what they're curious about tugboats, would they come to an exhibit about tugboats. As designs develop, maybe you start to have sketches or you even have a mock up um, and then you have formative evaluation where you're actually, you know, bringing visitors in to look at sketches and look at mock ups and get their reactions to things. And then finally, once the exhibit or program opens, you, you come back in and find out what's really going on. And we'll go into each of those in a little more detail. And I know this chart is tiny, but I just, I, I love it. I want to show it to you. Um, and you'll find it if you go to that toolkit that I was mentioning um, from, the, um, from the UK um, Museums League, um, and there'll be a link at the end. But this, so this brings you through the life cycle of a, so the, the example there is a museum in, uh, in the UK that was doing a project on ancient Egyptians. Um, and so at the front end, oh, sorry. Very good, there it is. Um, at the front end, you find, wanna find out some basic things like who's already visiting, um, are museum visitors representative of the total population? What are the needs of those people, especially relative to that topic? Um, how would they like to see this material displayed and talked about? Um, as it becomes a formative or prototyping, you want to see, you know, do those interactives work? Do people read the labels? Um, and notice the little white arrows going around and around. All of this is very iterative so that, you know, what you learn at front end gets fed into the formative. What you learn at the formative, they get fed back in because you have to go back to the beginning. Um, and then finally, you wind up with um, a working exhibit about ancient Egyptians and you go back in to see um, what else is going on. Okay, and sorry, there's a funny little uh, text. Okay, so now we're gonna go through um, a few case studies and show you sort of how this plays out um, in the real world of the Connecticut um, History Museum landscape. So front end, and the example here was at the Litchfield Historical Society. So um, the, this type of work takes place at the very, very beginning, and you want to find out what visitors think about your ideas, what they know about the ideas, what they would like to learn about it, and how they feel about a topic. Um, so in this case, we wanted to say, uh, you know, what could we ask about Connecticut's Western Reserve um, during a front end study? And what we did was we designed um, an, um, an online survey that went out to both uh, the Litchfield Historical Society members, some other mail lists that they had, and it even went out to an Ohio 
uh, historical society member list because we want to get both ends of the reserves um, reactions to what they knew about this. So what do visitors already know about the Western Reserve? What do they express curiosity about? Are they interested in this topic? Uh, what feelings are evoked and what would they like to do in the exhibit about this topic? And uh, we were all extremely proud of what this online survey looked like. Um, it, so you can do amazing things with online surveys, more amazing sometimes than what you could do with a paper survey. And that's something that's really good to think about because um, online surveys can be very cost effective um, and the quality of the data that you get back can be extraordinary. Um, and I, I think that's sort of like a human nature, you know, if somebody approaches you in a public setting like a museum with a survey, you'll probably agree to answer questions, but you know, in the privacy of your own home, you can look at an image that's being presented, you can think about it a little bit. And we've been finding that the quality of the data that we get is just phenomenal from online surveys. So um, this was just, you know, one of maybe 25 or 30 questions that we asked. Um, so, you know, thinking about stories specific to Litchfield, uh, which is the eastern end of the migration story, you know, what would you like to see or hear? And, you know, we got, you know, over 100 answers and just, you know, so some on the bottom, um, why some people left and why some stayed and did any move back? Personal stories. Did any of the migrants return to Connecticut? Um, so these are, this was great feedback um, for, the, for the team, you know, to look at. But we also asked, you know, some more um, standard types of questions. So this is, you know, you know, on a, on a rating from low to high interest. Here are some of the things that you might actually see in there. Um, and so visitors just were able to rate things. And artifacts and objects were the highest rated elements, um, which was a great surprise for for some of us. And uh, text panels, unsurprisingly, were the poorest rated. But this was all. This was an online um, survey. Um, and then we had some other questions that sort of talked about bigger themes. Um, the exhibit is going to cover many aspects of the Connecticut's Western Reserve. Uh, tell me which of these you'd like to see emphasized. Um, and you can see that, you know, why people left Litchfield or stayed in Connecticut came out um, at the top, which, you know, sort of meshed with what we saw in some of the open-ended. So that was, you know, that's a nice way to look at data when it, when it sort of overlaps in that way. But this was, um, this was a, a really fun and very useful project. And we are now moving ahead with some formative um, work on, on this very story. Formative or prototyping. Um, and here the case study um, is something uh, from the Mattatuck Museum. And so, you know, during, during the design process, when your ideas are starting to take shape, you do prototyping or formative. There are lots of reasons why this makes sense. Uh, it's cheap. It has a high predictive validity, um, which means that the way people react to something that's made out of poster board and cardboard and duct tape is shockingly similar to how they'll react to when it's, you know, a full fledged, um, you know, laminated and stainless steel and glass um, um, thing in your galleries. Um, it's extremely good at getting staff buy-in, uh, particularly from people who um, are maybe a little skeptical about the process of evaluation, because you build your prototype and you bring it out to the museum floor and you watch as people interact with it. And, you know, within two or three hours, you literally have enough data to go back to the drawing board. Um, so at the Mattatuck Museum, we were focusing on text panels and uh, whether both the design, because they, they had a hinge in it, whether the, the, the design worked and also was the content um, sort of compelling and did it make sense. Um, so th this, this, um, this list of sort of function and knowledge and affect and meaning is something that um, you'll, you'll hear sort of coming up over and over again. So these are all, you know, we're not just looking at what people learned, but how they interacted. Do they read the labels? Do they interact with staff? Um, do they talk to other visitors? What about the design works and doesn't work? Certainly, what are people learning? Um, did the mock-up panel make people care about the contents? Did they get the messages? And so what we did was, uh, you can see in the, in the photo here on the left is an about Evaluator and on the right is a visitor. We set up these, uh, and that's a mock-up uh, made out of a uh, poster board that we brought to not only the floor of the Mattatuck Museum, but we brought to the Barnes and Noble in Waterbury, and we brought to a uh, community college lounge in Waterbury. And we had people come in and read the panels and tell us about it. And you can see from some of the quotes that are up here, 
they focused on all kinds of things. Some of it was logistical and design uh, comments and others were, it was lovely to see that it brought up connections, that it reminded people of things that they collected. Um, and so they were, So it, it, we found that a lot of it worked, but some things needed to be tweaked. Uh, and then here, here is the final um, version of some of those panels. So um, we kept certain design elements, we adjusted others and, um, and here it is being, being used on the floor. So very practical. And let's see. So my advice to anybody who wants to um, do prototyping is just go for it. Just, you know, really experiment. Um, don't get stuck on details and, you know, what we would say like, like fidelity. It really doesn't matter so much. I mean, we've done some where it's, you know, a Sharpie on a poster board um, to test out content. So it's, it's good just get something out on the floor. Um, and I will also say that, you know, Amherst is gonna talk later about funding from Kinetic Humanities and something that Scott Wan shared with us um, yesterday was that of all the different phases of evaluation work they fund, prototyping is the one that people ask for least. And, that it, and that's interesting. Um, so it is certainly something that is fundable um, and, you know, could be, could be very, very useful. And remember, it's not just for exhibits. You can prototype programs. <laughs> you can prototype a marketing campaign. Um, you can prototype anything. Okay, and now we'll turn to uh, a case study at the Florence Griswold um, with a summative study. So, you know, this is when the exhibit is done, when it has been built, and when the laminated panels are up and the objects are on the floor, and you sort of go back in to find out um, what's working and what's not, and using any method you want. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this was um, an art exhibition which was up um, and we wanted to find out what visitors, Great Americans, I believe is the name of it. Um, I've got David over there to correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, but we, now in this case, what we did was we designed um, a, a, both a paper survey and an online survey. So we had, um, it wasn't just sent out to people on a mailing list, but we had um, people with paper on a clipboard. And then we also tried an iPad version of it, which was um, on a stand right outside the gallery. And so these questions here were things that the, um, the curatorial and educational staff were, were interested in learning more about. Um, so, you know, did visitors understand and were they interested in alternative representations of historical figures, uh, the nature of cultural identity? So these are pretty high, um, high educational objectives. And, um, you know, and we found out that yes, in many cases, um, this worked very, very well. Um, I love that quote about seeing George Washington in denim it certainly made you look at him differently. But so these, these are, um, you know, in addition to, you know, like the rating scales and, you know, sort of more standard, you know, we always include lots of open-ended questions that um, contain these, you know, wonderful, juicy comments from visitors that really help you uh, you know, put everything else um, into perspective. So um, just, you know, another, another example. Um, in addition to front end, formative and summative, I know I said there were only three, but there's actually a whole other animal, which are things like uh, what we did at Mystic Seaport um, last summer. And this was more of a marketing study. It wasn't a strict marketing study, but it was adapting um, evaluation methods to talking to visitors and non-visitors about Mystic Seaport. So the staff wanted to know what the people, you know, what comes to mind when you hear Mystic Seaport, um, what your expectations for the visit versus the reality of what happens after, and why do people come all the way to Mystic Town, but not come to the seaport. Um, in this case, we did it all with paper surveys because we needed to um, talk to people in person. And we did, we, it was actually a really fun, it was during the summer and it was fun. And we stood out in the parking lot and we captured people who were entering the seaport. And we first found out, you know, is this your first visit or your return visitor? And we had two separate surveys for that. And then at the end of the day, we captured people coming out of the seaport and said, you know, like, was this your first visit? And they had one set of questions because we wanted to see what people who had never been there before, what, you know, what they thought of their first visit and then returning people. Um, and then we trotted downtown and we did something very similar. And we found out, you know, to talk to people who were in the downtown area, uh, whether they had ever been to Mystic Seaport, whether they were planning to go to Mystic Seaport later that day or that weekend. Um, and if not, why not? And what they knew about it. 
So it was, it was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> All aspects of that study were really fun. Um, and we did get a lot of feedback um, about what people know and love about the seaport, um, their misconceptions of it. And um, it was very helpful. And I know that the report is still being, you know, sort of circulated around various parts of, of the seaport um, in different meetings being talked about. Um, so this is some examples of the questions we asked. Um, you know, if you've never visited before, um, have you ever heard of Mystic Seaport? If you have heard of it, what have you heard? What are your impressions? Um, how did you find out about it? Does it seem like it's a good place for you and your family? Um, what's the main reason you haven't visited? So those sort of questions. And uh, the reason I say it's, it, it was sponsored by the marketing department, but it wasn't like a strict marketing study. It was sort of more of a visitor experience, um, visitor perception study. Um, and these are some of the, uh, the juicy, rich comments that we got. Um, you know, it, it's a place to connect and make memories. And I, I love this one, uh, this man who had been coming, um, you know, since he was in middle school, he's now in his seventies. He comes four to five times a year. Um, he wants more people to come. And he said, they'll wheel me here on a gurney one last time someday. So um, you can find out, you know, what, why, people, uh, why people love you, why people don't love you and sort of uh, begin to understand like sort of what your, what your brand is and what, what your special experience is. Okay, we can take another brief, brief pause. <laughs> Amherst, is there anything I need to know? Um, nothing is too pressing. Um, Fielding had another comment, um, you know, just uh, a question kind of about uh, wanting to hear more about what you think impeded the QR code approach. Um, sharing that the first time I tried that about 10 years ago at a university, students were afraid to use them for fear their device would be infected or broken by it. Um, I was kind of hoping that fluency in tech had evolved. And I know there's a lot of questions about QR codes um, and how people sort of respond to them. Um, yes. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that. And then um, we also have a question coming in about focus groups. Sure, sure. And, and I will be talking about focus groups in a few minutes. So I can um, I can hold that one. And then if you still have a okay, question. David can, can wait. Can... It's David. He can wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. David. <laughs> um, yes. So um, what we found is that almost no one uses QR codes, but the reasons people don't use them are all over the place. Some people do not know what they are. Some people know what they are and don't like them. Um, for and why do they not like them for a variety of reasons and that is it's really sort of fascinating and I'm still sort of sifting through the data but there are people who feel that it's an invasion of their privacy that they do not want their personal device connecting to something uh, public um, there are people who feel like they came to a museum to look at objects they do not even want to take their phone out of their pocket um, and there and so those are the people so that tends to be the people who are not interested and then there are people who say I have enough information. There's plenty here. I love all that you've provided. I don't need anything else. I'm not looking for anything else. And I really just want to experience this gallery and these objects without you know, taking out my phone. Um, there are certainly people who don't know what they are. Um, and it's it was, you know, people have people struggle, you know. So we first just watched. We did that was both observation and survey in that case. And um, so, so few people used it that we had to then invite people in and say, hello, we are doing a QR code study. Would you please attempt to use this QR code? Um, and it wasn't that easy. So for, you know, fumbling around the phone, opening it up, taking a picture of it by mistake, you know, all of those sort of classic things. Um, we then asked people, you know, is it maybe that you just don't want to use them in a museum context? And there's certain people for whom that's the case because they just want to experience the real world and real objects. But there's other people who say uh, that they don't use QR codes anywhere. Um, and, but we wondered if, you know, because we had read some of the data um, and studies that had been done a decade ago. And we thought, well, you know, since COVID came, QR codes became more ubiquitous, um, but not, not in a way yet <laughs> that would mean that we should include them in museum exhibits. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Thanks. Anyone who's um, interested in that, uh, yeah, we're, we're still sifting through all the data and we have one more phase of that study to go. So stay tuned. Stay tuned on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm sure there is a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people have questions about that. We'll hold David's question for when you, um, after you've had a chance to say a bit about focus groups, but um, sure. Mariana has a question. What would you say is the ideal amount or types of questions, I think for, you know, these sorts of surveys that you're talking about, so people don't get bored and stop? Yes, um, it really depends on which mode. And that's another advantage to online surveys where we're finding that we can really push our luck. 
<laughs> with, with online surveys. Um, and we can have, I mean, I think some have had 20, close to 30 questions in some cases, and people fill them all out thoughtfully uh, until the very bitter end. Um, whereas in person, there is no way you could get through. No way, no way. Whether it's, yeah, uh, and part of it's terminology, but um, you know, you can give people a clipboard and have them fill it out themselves, um, or you can interview them. Um, and, but in both cases, you know, we say like, it's like the one page rule. And so we try to avoid, you know, and we stretch it, we use legal size, you know, but it's, it's a psychological barrier to have to flip that piece of paper over. Um, so we try very hard to keep it on one page. We make our font small, we make our paper big, but that's really a limit. And so it just sort of depends on how many you can, you can squish onto that page. Um, that's a very crude sort of rule of thumb, but, but it does seem to work. And so, yes, I, I, you know, I, I was skeptical of online surveys until um, this last round. And now, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to <laughs> hope that we can sort of move in that direction. And you can even do online surveys on site. Um, the way Florence Griswold did it with an iPad um, station um, is, is great. And maybe, you know, possibly like a combination of like the best of both worlds. Um, so. Great, thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in. I don't know if you have more presentation that you want to do, and I then do. we'll get back to the I questions. Do. Okay, so for those of yep. you, who continue to send your questions in. Um, but uh, Karina has a few more things to say, and then we'll um, yes. we'll get back to them. I and promise we'll to get to your question. <laughs> okay, so and and this gets into sort of a uh, more of like the nitty gritty here. So what kind of methods are there? I mean, even though there's variations and basically you're either going to talk to people or you're going to watch people and so we'll go through some of the different ways that you can do those things if you need to know how visitors feel about something what they think about something what they've learned you're going to have to talk to them um, and those are, and that's where we like we just said so it's it's interviews or surveys um, sometimes you can do a pre and a post that's not that common uh, most of the time we just do an exit survey or an exit interview um, and, and if you're really sort of curious about how people, you know, like you want to find out, did going to this program change your feeling about tugboats, let's say, um, you know, you sure you could do a pre and a post, but sometimes you can just embed questions in it and say, compared to how much you thought about tugboats before you went to this program, and people are pretty good at sort of thinking about that. So interviews, surveys, um, and, and focus groups, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in each of them. Um, so interviews can either be um, paper or online. Um, a good survey or an interview combines questions uh, to make it sort of more uh, fun for the person filling it out. So we have some open-ended ones, you know, where you're just, where it, whether it's you, the survey giver writing down the answers, or it's the person, uh, the, the visitor. But so open-ended uh, questions, ratings, multiple choice, short answer. Um, if it's online, you saw the examples I did from, from the Litchfield Historical Society with putting images in. We even in that case embedded a video uh, into the online survey. Um, the video was sort of maybe I think 30 second, uh, and it was wonderful just sort of to talk to people about what the Western Reserve was, to sort of give them some background before they could answer some questions. But basically it's structured questions about the visitor experience. And um, you've seen some examples already. I mean, this is another fairly standard one. Um, and, you know, just so again, sort of uh, because if you and you always try to you sometimes start by just getting all the questions down and then you decide what type of questions they are. But you can see here there's an open ended one, which is number one. There's a checkbox for number two. There's a rating for the third one down. Um, and then there's even a place which is a little bit of experimental, but, um, you know, for you to put in your own notes. So not just did you pick up a visitor's guide, but they could say, no, didn't find them. No, um, you know, didn't think I needed one. So it gives you even a little bit of extra information. Um, focus groups um, are also a lot of fun to run. I love running focus groups. And we um, also during COVID, we all got very good at running online focus groups. And guess what? They work. They work really well. And they are cheaper to run and easier to set up. Um, 
We did some for Connecticut landmarks uh, when we were talking about a, a new interpretation plan for the Palmer Warner House. We ran a series of four different um, focus groups. And what we did was we, we used, I think it was their member mailing list. And we just sent out like a doodle poll. And we said, we're gonna run four focus groups uh, next week, you know, one at noon on Tuesday. So we had time slots, people signed up for them. We sent out Zoom links um, and, you know, we showed up and most of them showed up and we had um, a really great session. You can record it. Um, you can, you know, look at it later. You can share it with the staff because sometimes the staff don't come to that because they don't want to, you know, inadvertently influence what is being talked about in a focus group. Um, but anyway, so those were great. But you know, in-person ones are also wonderful in different ways. Um, and as part of the Litchfield Historical Society, after we finished the online surveys, we wound up attaching a set of focus groups to um, a holiday event that they had in December. So I think we ran two or three focus groups in an evening, maybe uh, 45 minutes each. Um, and we had sent out information uh, to people ahead of time. They could sign up, but they could also be sort of, you know, prompted. They could sort of join in the group. And we went to a quiet room away from the uh, refreshments um, and talked to them about the upcoming exhibit. And, you know, in that case, it's not being recorded. So it's nice to have, you know, two people, one to sort of do most of the talking and one to take notes on it. Um, so, so, yeah, so, you know, both online and in person uh, work really well. Okay, watching visitors. Um, and this is something else that uh, Scott Wands was saying, you know, you know, most of the evaluation work that they fund, just because that's most of the evaluation work that's being asked to be funded, tends to be survey um, related or interview related. But observation can be excellent. And if any of you have projects that you think could really benefit by some close observation, we should talk about that. Um, and so there's four different ways really that people uh, can be, that you can watch people. Um, naturalistic observation is the most basic and sometimes one of the most useful. Um, it can also be the start of any other type of project. And it's really where you're acting as like an anthropologist and you take your clipboard and a piece of paper and you go sit as unobtrusively as possible in a gallery space or during an event and you just watch what happens. And you as the museum professional, are probably very observant and you know, you're noting things like visitors don't seem interested, visitors look confused, uh, children are bored, uh, people aren't reading late, you know, all of those things that you observe and you write it down and you write it down and you write it down. And sometimes that's it. That and then you, you know, you go home and you spend an hour to sort of analyzing it, and that becomes um, that becomes a little report in itself. Other times it becomes the start of a survey project or another project. But it's, it's a super useful and super easy. I mean, you could go tomorrow and go sit in a gallery for half an hour, and I guarantee you will learn quite a bit. Um, then things can get more sophisticated. There's something called behavioral mapping, which produces these sort of hot and cold charts. Um, and sometimes, and it's not just big museums that want to do this. Sometimes historical houses, for instance, want to know which, which rooms are more interesting to people. Um, and even which objects within a space are more interesting. And so you're sort of, you're, you know, you're going, you have a clipboard and you're going through and you're sort of counting, you know, where people are. Maybe you're doing it, you know, every half hour on the half hour, or you're doing it during an event or a busy day. And just just quick, like little snapshots, but then you you build up enough data that you can then do something and look at uh, sort of like hot and cold areas. Other times you really want to drill down. Um, and this is actually uh, a detailed observation form that we just finished using with the QR code study <laughs> at Mystic Seaport. And you can see how detailed it gets. So the, the time the visitor went in, the time they went out, uh, the crowd level, how many people were in their group. Um, when they went into the gallery, did they turn right or left? And then, so I only did P1 through P4 um, running down the side there, but I think there were 30, 30 different possible places that, that they could have stopped in that gallery. Um, and then you're just going to make it, did they look at check mark? Did they look at the object? Did they read the panel? Did they use the QR code? Did they watch the video? So super detailed. Um, and I think we only collected 25 of those, but that was enough for us to know that the QR code column was blank. <laughs> so very conclusive. You don't always need a lot of data to answer some questions. Uh, tracking and timing is a lot of fun. It's uh, an architectural level um, or architectural plan where you're tracing. So how, you, maybe you want to know how people move through a gallery. Um, and that can tell you a lot too about 
not just the pathway, but where they stop and where they don't. Um, these are some beautiful forms that my students actually designed for uh, Florence Griswold. This was to look at the artist's trail. So this was an outdoor um, exhibition, which I believe is still there. And so this was good, David's nodding, <laughs> thank you. Um, this was to uh, watch what visitors did on that trail. Uh, where they stopped and you notice that there's a nice box for extra information that you could note, you know, like child started crying, parents had to leave in a hurry, you know, it's, it's whatever seems important um, for you to notice. But I just thought it was, yeah, students did a great job designing that. All right, we're going to skip over this because we're coming to the end. So evaluation sounds great and I've shown you that it can be really easy. So why don't we evaluate more? And I've sort of clumped these a little bit, but Lack of time, skills, and money. <laughs> Those are the three big ones. Um, you know, some of us work in small places. There is no way you could imagine, you know, conducting, certainly you couldn't conduct a big study, um, but I bet that you can conduct something little. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, skills, I mean, certainly coming to this workshop, I mean, you, you know, you won't become an evaluator after this hour and a half, but, you know, you'll start to be thinking about it. And we have more resources to share with you soon. So you can build your own skills. Um, and money, if you're doing a tiny study, you don't need any money. If you're doing it in-house, you don't need any money. If you do need money, then um, there are some sources and Amherst will tell you more about those in a few minutes. There's some other reasons why we don't, because sometimes we don't want to hear, <laughs> we don't want to hear the bad news. Uh, and that's just human. Um, I worked for a museum once and the director said, you know, don't take your temperature if you're not willing to take the medication after. And, you know, and that's right. You know, it's, you know, none of this should be um, punitive and scary. It's really to make yourselves better and it's, it's constructive um, at its heart. Um, and the final one was just because I think some people really still feel that all evaluation does is measure against the original educational objectives or objectives period. And not only does that sound boring, but it sounds sort of pointless. So you've just seen a lot of examples of where evaluation had nothing to do with any of that. Um, so, you know, if you go back to the basics about questions, you know, this is where you'll all start. Um, maybe some of you have a project in mind, maybe some of you don't have a project in mind, but it's all going to get back to questions. Um, and I'm going to start moving a little faster because I know time is running out, but um, sometimes your questions have to do with function, um, how something is working or not working, um, and evaluation can help you answer that. Um, other times your questions are a little more esoteric and have to do with meaning and what people are getting out of an activity. And it's always about this gap. Like we intended for people to learn about certain things, but alas, they are not learning about it. So evaluation can sort of help you figure out what that gap is. Um, sometimes you have questions about participation that people don't seem engaged with each other, with uh, interpreters, with staff, with objects, with interactives. So obviously evaluation can help you figure out what's going on with that. Um, and sometimes you really have like soul searching basics um, that you want to understand, you know, do visitors know who you are, what you are, um, what you offer? Do they, do they like who you are and what you offer? How can you improve um, at, at least the communication of all of those things? Um, so evaluation can answer all of those and many more. And I think we're just going to keep going and we're going to keep going through this because I think that might come up. <laughs> You're welcome to pop into chat and I will be, you know, delighted to see if you have a little meeting or big projects that, uh, that we can talk about either today or later. And, but I wanted to, before I turn it over to um, resources and questions and answers. So if you are a small place or if you're a place that has no money, or if you're a place that has some ideas about things that need evaluating, but you don't want to write a grant proposal and get funding, what can you do? And there are lots of in-house options. So you can, can, you can keep going with self-training, uh, developing in-house skills of your own or somebody else on your staff. Um, by all means, use interns from colleges um, to help collect data and keep your costs down. Um, you can use software such as Google Forms. Um, you know, and, you know, many people would be happy to show you how shockingly easy it is to create a survey on Google Forms and send it out to your members or something. Um, but keep keep those projects simple. And, you know, I like to say, like, like, what could you do tomorrow? And I just mentioned that director's thermometer, you know, 
you could say, I, for the next two weeks, every day, I'm going to go out and ask uh, anyone I see at my <laughs> at my site one to three questions. Maybe first I'll focus on how you found out about us, or I'll ask, um, you know, do we think do you think we have enough for people like you, or is there enough information here for you, or spend 30 minutes observing. You know, go sit in a gallery tomorrow and just quietly watch. You know, with a notepad um, and see what you see. You might be very surprised. Um, like this picture here, um, create, and it can be simple. It does not need to be a whole corner of a gallery with a table and chairs. It can be a whiteboard or a bulletin board with sticky notes or little index cards with push pins. But, you know, you could pose a question, you know, what's your favorite thing to do here? You know, what do you like about coming to visit? Um, and also, of course, you, you know, circle back and see what, see what they're saying. Um, Please ask your ask your front front of line staff. They know everything. Um, you'll be you know sometimes I will start a project by talking you know even though I'm sort of behind the scenes and maybe talking to the director and the curator. It's really nice to go and find out what the people who are actually watching when visitors come into your space. Um, you know Florence Griswold has you know people at the the gift shop right there. They see everything. They know what people are confused about and what they're looking for. Pose a question on Facebook or so, or another social media um, source that you use. Um, read your visitors book. Um, sometimes there's gems <laughs> that are just hidden in there. Call three teachers who came in um, on field trips uh, this year. You know, just do one phone call a day and see what they thought. Uh, or go on your floor and just don't even use a survey of any sort, but just, engage, you know, talk to three visitors. So coming down to the final stretch here. Um, this book here is, I, I cannot tell, I cannot recommend it enough. You can find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I think it costs $15. My students use it and pour over it. It, you know, if you self-studied, you could teach yourself almost all aspects of evaluation using this book. So I would, I would go order that book right away. And any, there's three editions, any of them are fine. Um, this is the website um, that I was telling you about. And it's actually, there's a PDF, so it's an evaluation toolkit. Um, it comes with this beautifully designed uh, PDF set that walks you through all the methods and what to do and what not to do and has its own bibliography built in. There's no way you can read this font, but you'll be getting this. Um, I will send it as a PDF for you. Uh, the Committee on Audience Research and Evaluation has put together a fabulous list of both sort of seminal articles. Some of them are quite old, but they're classics up to very contemporary. And they also have this excellent source of websites for extra help for you. Um, these are three organ four organizations um, that can really help move you through the visitor studies. They have conferences, they have journals, they have uh, set webinars, they have everything you could imagine. Um, evaluate, which is for the National Science Foundation, but they have more general evaluation uh, information. And then CARE, the Committee on Audience Research and Evaluation for AAM. And my program, um, you, you can take classes with us for sure, um, even as uh, you don't have to take, you don't have to come in to get a full master's degree, you can take one or two classes, but you also, we have interns who would love to help you. Um, and I can talk to you about that. And I also use um, a different real museum around Connecticut every semester in my evaluation class. So we're working with the Connecticut Historical Society this semester. So you could volunteer to be um, to be a client for my class. And that is free, of course. So, whew, all right, <laughs> that, that was a lot. Um, and this is Paul about whether, and we don't know what form this would be. Maybe this will be a panel, maybe this will be a, a workshop over lunch, maybe this will be, um, I don't know, there's a lot of ways that we could do this, but I would love to meet in person with as many of you as possible um, on June 6th, so lots of maybes and some yeses and some noes, that is absolutely fine. <laughs> and for those of you I mean, and so unfortunately, we don't have an open-ended saying, now, if you say no, why is that? Because maybe you can't come to the conference. And so um, we'll, tomorrow, I'll be sending out some more information about how we can stay connected. And so, you know, even if you can't come to the conference, there will be other ways um, for us to work on projects and think about projects together. Okay. Whew. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Karina. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> so share those results quickly. Um, yes. And um, I, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for um, for questions. So um, I'm going to do my little spiel very, very quickly, if now is the appropriate time to do that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I'm sorry. Great. Yep. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to stop and sharing I can... for a second. Um, yep. Hi, everybody. Nice to see all your faces <laughs> again. All I wanted to do um, is just remind you of a couple of things. Um, uh, let me just make sure that my, my browser is going to the right place right now. Okay, can you see my screen? Um, should just be a little um, web browser here. So I wanted to just um, talk a little bit. So um, you can get funding to do evaluation in the projects and work that you're doing both kind of on an organizational level, but also um, for particular projects that you may be working on. Um, I know that many of the people on this call are probably recipients of the Connecticut F Cultural Fund Operating Support Grants from Connecticut Humanities. Um, and you're already doing some informal data collection, you know, informal or perhaps more formal as a part of this. Um, if you are interested in um, some templates for collecting visitation and audience data, I wanna refer you to, and I'll pop these links in the chat after I'm done and we're doing the Q&A, but, um, Connecticut Humanities has put together some tips um, with Susie Wilkening, who they're working with on this um, data collection uh, for collecting visitation and audience data at your institution. So this is just a quick PDF about um, some categories of data that are a part of the, these grants, and then some sample language about how to um, incorporate this into um, you know, you know, whether frontline staff are asking it or whether it's something that you um, use in a, a, a ticketing or reservation um, system. Uh, I also wanted to um, remind you what you can do with data collection. Um, one of the things that um, Connecticut Humanities has been doing is putting together um, this sort of cultural census data infographics um, with Susie Wilkening. And you can, th this is helping us understand a lot more about the sector. So um, I, I will pop these links in the chat um, and just remind you that um, if you're applying for, um, you, know, you can use operating support funds for evaluation that you're doing at your institution. You can also apply for standalone grants, capacity grants, project planning or implementation grants, or quick grants from Connecticut Humanities. Evaluation expenses are um, eligible funds for all of those grant lines. That's all I want to share, um, and I want to get to um, the questions. So I think uh, Emily has um, a few uh, queued up for you now. Excellent. All right, great. Um, so we can, I'll just go through some of the questions that came through in the chat. Um, we can go back to uh, David's question from before. Um, so David asks, what about focus groups? How to, um, how do we choose the right people and how much weight um, can you put in what you hear? Yeah, oh, good questions. Um, yes, it it depends on the nature of your focus group. I mean, if you're with the Palmer Warner group, for instance, we just wanted sort of general public, so we weren't concerned about trying to like stratify it and you know only get people of certain characteristics. But sometimes you do, um, and there are lots of ways. And, and I I don't know how in, how in the weeds um, you want me to get, but yes, we sometimes you want very particular subsets of visitors in focus groups um, and it's it's not that hard to do but I mean you would sort of do screening you know you could so for instance you might send it out to your member group but then sort of screen them through that so you know do you have children do you have you know and then sort of winnow it down and then invite them to focus groups um, so I mean that, that's one way certainly to do it and we can also do more direct recruitment um, through social media um, and I would say that focus groups are an excellent addition to other data forms. Um, every now and then somebody only wants to do focus groups because they just sort of want like subjective, rich data period. Um, and that's fine. But I find it's more useful like the way the Litchfield Society did it where we did two big quantitative surveys in advance of that and then use the focus groups to sort of hone in on some of the things that we heard in the surveys as well. Um, so I think it's, I love doing them in tandem. Um, it's, it's unusual to do them alone. 
All right, great. Um, so the next question comes from uh, Melissa and Susie from the Lockwood Matthews Mansion Museum. Um, they say, what is considered the reasonable amount of questions for a survey? Sure, and that might have been the one that we were talking about with, um, with you know, so like online, you can get away with a lot more. I mean, you, you could go up to 30 um, and not just 30 simple ones, but 30 complex ones at times. Um, you know, I, I still think it's nice to sort of, um, to weave them together so you have an open-ended and then you have a closed and, you know, it's just, it's a more, it's a more interesting experience for the visitor to go through. Um, but in person, um, you know, I can send some examples maybe, you know, as part, or we, we can talk about that more later, but, you know, it's the one page rule um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, you know, there are font limits <laughs> to how small you should go for sure. But, you know, the, the key, the key is to sort of keep it on, keep it on that one page. Um, and I've seen some pretty tightly designed one pages, but there's just something, like I said, something very psychological about, you know, and even if it's me, you know, you know, and I have my clipboard and they can see me getting toward the end. Oh, they groan, you know, if I have to turn it over. So, you know, try to keep it, try to keep it on that one page. And, and your data starts to tail off in uh, quality, you know, at that point in person anyway. So it's a, it's a good rule of thumb. Great. Okay. And to that point, we have another question. Um, my apologies. It actually came right before it um, from Blanche um, asking, how different is it to use evaluation when children 10 years old or school groups visit your museum? Um, it's sure different, <laughs> but, but it, it absolutely can be done. Um, and in fact, some of my like favorite, you know, my favorite experiences as an evaluator were ones where I, I worked with children on it. Um, you, it, you know, so certainly observation is relatively straightforward, although you better be sort of quick um, at, you know, they, they move faster. And certainly if they're in a school group, I mean, they're moving really fast through things, but, you know, and you have to get permission, of course. So, you know, the, the, the teacher bringing in the school group would be, you would let them know in advance that this was happening. Um, surveys, you know, I, I've done surveys successfully with, uh, with elementary school kids um, and up. Um, and again, it's more about, um, you know, sort of the, the dynamics, you know, if when, you know, there I am with my clipboard, you know, approaching, you know, a parent and a child, you know, I, I speak to the parent first, you know, and then get permission and interview the child. Um, you know, there are certainly ways to, you know, to, to design the survey so that it's more compelling for a child. Um, you know, we've done a drawing exercises as part of the um, survey you know, where we sort of hand the clipboard over to them and say, you know, can you draw us a quick picture of something you really liked? But, you know, most of the time um, you can just, you know, sort of bring, bring the wording down to, um, several levels and, and it's fine, uh, both open-ended and closed. You know, we've, we've had good luck um, as well as focus groups, um, you know, and, you know, I mean, David Rao um, at Florence Griswold and I have done some in-classroom um, focus groups with kids and, and it's great, it works well. I mean, particularly in that kind of context, because they're sort of used to, you know, an adult speaking to them. But, you know, we had, you know, we did what you might call like a focus group with like 20 people, <laughs> 20 students, um, and, and it worked really well. So, you know, but I've done them in museums as well. So yes, it's all doable, very doable. Great, okay. Um, next question is from Katie. Um, she asks, does evaluator presence impact observational studies in small or low visitation galleries? Yes, yes, such a good question. Um, I have 15 students right now who are off trying to evaluate um, in, in different places around the US and some of them are really having a hard time remaining hidden. So, you know, because the ideal is to be completely hidden because you don't want your presence to impact their behavior because then it's it's not um, nor it's not you know it's not typical so you know we have tricks that we can use um so sometimes um i'll go in with a sketch pad what looks like a sketch pad you know and i'll be sitting in a corner and people just the key is to sort of sometimes to be in there already so that and to be in there already doing something that looks like you're not even paying attention when somebody walks in, but of course you sort of are paying attention. Um, so, so, so that's a good trick. Um, sometimes it is better to sort of follow them in. So you're somewhere outside the gallery and you see somebody enter and you just, but you can't look creepy. So, you know, maybe I mean, you've got your phone out or you've got, you know, something else that you're sort of looking at. 
it, it's an art <laughs> for sure, um, but most of the time we can figure it out. Um, I've also had situations where students have tried to use the existing security cameras because, I mean, that's an amazing source of data. Um, if, it's, if it's pointed the right way and you're capturing what you want to look at, it's an amazing source of data. But yes, it usually involves you know, some experimentation so that you can find a place in the gallery where you can see more and they can't see you. Um, <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, the Springfield Preservation uh, Trust. They ask um, if we can have your email address. Um, maybe if you just want to pop that in the chat, um, yes. contact information. Yeah. And I think um, it sounds like, Karina, you're planning on sending out a follow up email with a lot of these resources in it. Yes. Um, so um, we'll make sure that everyone you know, knows how to contact Karina um, yeah. and has a list of the resources that have either been shared in her presentation or that we've popped in the chat in the meantime. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. I think we may just have one more question, I think, from Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, at Fairfield Museum um, who asked, what do you think the best way is um, to evaluate a public program or an education program? Would you follow a similar formula to evaluating an exhibit or is it a method that's totally different? Um, it's not totally different, but it would be, I guess it depends whether it's uh, an in-person in -person program and there are you would but it's the same it's the same set of methods but it's sort of applied differently so um you might design a survey that went out um after the event so if you have emails from people who signed up for the event that's you, that's wonderful so then you can just send out your survey to everyone who came to the program um, that's easy you can also observe during it um and it's sort of a that's definitely something that you would want to hone your skill on but you can you know, so you would just be like, let's say we were evaluating this program right now. Um, I might be noting, you know, how many people have their cameras on? How many people have their cameras off? How many people ask questions? Um, how many people use the chat? Do people look engaged? You know, I, but I would have sort of like a code. Um, so you could, you could definitely collect quite a bit of information, you know, in this kind of setting. And certainly if you were in person, you know, so if it's, an, uh, if it's something that's happening in your gallery, it's an, it's an activity or it's a speaker, you know, you would just be there with your clipboard. Um, and I would say, you know, you wouldn't want to keep it, you could do naturalistic and just sort of, you know, note everything that seems to happen. Um, but sometimes it's better to codify that so that you might have a list of like the 10 most common things you think are going to happen in that. And it's things like people asking questions, people on their phones, people talking to the person next to them, people looking engaged, you know, and just do lots of little tick marks um, during the program. I mean, ideally you have a program that runs more than once. So the first time you just go in with like that anthropology, you know, like naturalistic observation and come up with those 10 categories. And then you're really prepared if the program runs again. Yeah, that's great. Those are such great tips, Karina, for kind of like streamlining that process and thinking a little bit about how to make it easier to do sort of live and in real time. Yes. Um, I'm because conscious of the... Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm yeah, conscious of the time here. I know that um, we've had we've had some folks dropping off and I know that, you know, it's getting toward the end of the day and people have other things to do. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, this has really been a wonderful session and especially thank Karina for um, her generosity in sharing her expertise with us and also um, her willingness to follow up and continue this conversation. Um, so we're going to be in true evaluation style, um, mm -hmm. you know, reaching out to you with more information asking you a little bit about what you thought um, and also thinking about how we can continue these conversations beyond this particular program. So you can expect to hear more from Karina and from the league. Um, and thank you so much for um, being with us today. Um, let's have a great virtual round of applause um, for our speaker. <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again too um, at upcoming league programs. I'll remind you that we'll be having our annual business meeting and awards of merit presentation in the, uh, at, from 5 to 7 p.m. at Connecticut Historical Society on April 19th. That's a Tuesday. We hope to see you there. Um, and as Karina mentioned, our annual conference, which will be in Weathersfield, Connecticut, is on June 6th. 
So um, the call for sessions is out right now. Um, you can go to our website, clho.org, um, for more information about how to submit a session. We'd love to see you there. Um, and presenters get discounted registration um, to the conference. So um, we would love to know what you want to talk about. Our theme this year is um, the future of history, um, you know, thinking about how we're coming out of the pandemic and thinking about new ways, ways of working. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for being here today. And I look forward to seeing you again soon at another league program. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. It was great. <laughs>